thank you for having me. And can you see the slide deck okay? Yeah. Perfect. Just, just fine, coming through clearly. All righty. Well, thanks very much for having me. Thanks for the nice intro as well, Jeff. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk about solar systems today. Uh, so uh, hopefully buckle down. It'll be about an hour. Um, we can go into as many numbers or as few numbers as you like. So this presentation has a little bit more in some of the calculation side because we often forget to do that. Um, I also dropped in the chat links to my QRZ and uh, the presentation, almost the same one that we're going over today, if you'd like to follow along. Um, if you're that type of learner, that always works. So um, yeah, as said, I'm Marcel Stieber, AI6MS. I was licensed in 2008 as KI6QDJ when I was a student at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo um, studying electrical engineering. I'm still heavily involved with the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club as one of their advisors. I'm also involved in Cupertino Aries and a handful of other repeater groups and uh, commercial event groups doing radio consulting, tower climbing, RF technician work, you name it. Um, I've particularly been playing with solar since, uh, well, 1995, if you count the little uh, solar thing that I plugged into some Legos, uh, and uh, 2010, if you really count proper big radio sites with, with radio battery stuff. Um, so currently I've got two off-grid radio sites um, one of them has been running nonstop for it just hit its five-year anniversary, which is quite exciting, uh, with 100% uptime. So that's a little claim to fame that I'm quite proud of, um, and uh, not something that we can all say about some of our other sites. So um, that's kind of my qualifications background, if you will. Um, so today we're going to walk through what um, design for an off-grid uh, solar power radio site looks like. Uh, so we'll talk about power budgets, we'll talk about some equipment options, uh, and then uh, finish up with some maintenance uh, case study pictures and some pretty interesting stuff there. Um, throughout the talk, we're going to use uh, that actual that five-year site that's been running now. We'll use that kind of as our case study for some of our calculations and kind of explain how I went around design for that and uh, how that might apply to you. Um, so uh, first off, kind of a show of hands, uh, how many people here have deployed an off-grid site? like solar panels with batteries. Anyone? Good, okay. It's fresh, sometimes we have. Okay, there's one there, Mel. Um, anyone else, has anyone uh, owns a solar panel? Who has solar panels, either on your house or, or for ham radio? I know Pacific Northwest, so fewer, but okay, we've got a couple of folks as well. So, so it's always nice to see that, um, but that, that should work out. So we'll go ahead and talk about solar systems high level, what we're talking about in this talk. Um, and then go through the three parts or the four parts of kind of building out the system. So DC loads, battery, the solar panels, the actual controllers, um, how to do some deployment, and then the maintenance at the end. Um, I have got a handful of fun pictures in here. So if you have questions about any of them, feel free to raise a hand or chime in. Uh, this one's a simulcast site in the Bay Area from WB6ECE, uh, fully off grid, sits in a little box behind it and just runs. So it's pretty fun. Uh, so quick intro. So why solar? So, um, well, we need power to power our radios, right? That's always <laughs> the running joke. Um, getting grid power to new sites is expensive, right? Running um, with your local electric company, getting them to run new power lines and poles uh, takes a lot of money, takes a lot of doing to actually pull that off. Um, so off-grid gives you a lot of independence um, and it means that your running costs are relatively low. Um, you don't pay any monthly expenses, though you do have your, you know, amortized costs for all the equipment that goes into it. So if you're doing calculations on that, you have to see if that makes sense. Um, interestingly enough, especially in rural areas, there are a lot of wireless ISPs that are now doing off-grid solar sites. And they find it's cheaper and easier and safer for them to deploy those. They have way more independence and they can actually get enough reliability to run a commercial um, ISP site there. So internet service provider for clients, which is pretty impressive. Um, Previously, that was really reserved for kind of research sites and other folks. Um, so a little background, uh, re residential solar versus radio sites. So for residential, we often talk like the rooftop solar systems, you usually have an inverter involved and you're dealing with AC loads. So you'll have microwaves, fridges, TVs, et cetera, that are running on 120 volts AC. Um, so you have this whole inverter. So in this little diagram here, the bottom right, you'd have your inverter and an AC load um, if you were running uh, a house solar system, for example, with a battery backup. Um, for radio sites, you generally don't want to deal with AC. If all your equipment runs on DC anyway, so there's really no reason to do conversion twice. Um, so generally we're talking, when we talk about um, solar systems for radio sites, we're going to make this assumption that all our loads are DC loads. We don't have AC power involved at all. 
Um, and we just have these four blocks of the system. So those are the four blocks we'll go through today. Solar panels, solar controller, battery bank, and DC loads. So what you're actually plugging into it, that's your radios and such. Um, the other assumption that I'm making for today's talk is using off the shelf solutions. So there, there's quite a big DIY community in this space that's building their own batteries, building their own solar panels, even building their own solar controllers. Um, that's outside of the scope today, so I won't dig into that. Okay. Um, and then the mental model that we generally use for off-grid solar systems um, is that we always have to design for the worst case. So in the middle of the summer, you're always going to have plenty of power. Your batteries are going to be full. You're going to have long days with a lot of sunlight. Um, but what we need to design for is the worst case, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Um, you've got shorter days. You've got more cloudy days. You've got um, fewer systems you might have to deal with lower temperatures. So you have to deal with heating your batteries or heating your system or making sure that things are at the right temperatures. Um, so you have to account for all those when you're designing for your worst case. Um, generally speaking, when we design systems, we're planning for this 100% uptime. Now, that might not be required. So depending on your site, if 100% uptime isn't required, you can lower a lot of your requirements significantly and bring down the cost of your deployment quite significantly. And we'll show some examples of that later as well. Um, but generally speaking, 100% uptime is usually what we're going for. Um, because in the amateur radio world, when all else fails, you don't want your system to also then suddenly fail because it's that coldest, shortest day in the middle of winter and your system runs out of power. So the case study we'll be using is from this Cupertino Aries uh, ARCnet project. Um, this was kind of a brainchild of myself and uh, my buddy Kenneth, W6KWF. Um, and we built out this wireless emergency intranet for um, the city of Cupertino. Uh, this is one of our client sites. So it's this 40 foot shipping container that sits on a campus um, and has a pretty simple setup. So solar panel on top, um, but really the, the hardware we're trying to power is this uplink radio. It's on this mast on the top right. You can barely see it. Um, there's a radio that points back to our, our sector site. We have a local wireless access point, a local camera that just keeps an eye on the container. Um, and then uh, analog telephone adapters. You got phone system inside and that allows the city to make phone calls and see and talk between different locations around the city, fully off-grid, totally independent of any um, infrastructure, which is great. Um, so that's what we'll be using for the case study today. So first section is DC loads, right? So when we talk about an off-grid site, the question is, what are we doing with that, right? That might be a weather station that you're deploying. That might be a repeater site that you're deploying. That might be an APRS digipeater. It might be a mesh network node for Arden or something or Hamwan. Uh, or might be a remote base HF station that you want to set up so you and your friends can get a better, um, lower noise, higher, <laughs> the larger towers, um, remote base site. Um, really depends. Uh, this photo is from one of our events. Uh, we, we have a generator here running for the actual event weekend when we have a dozen repeaters running in there, or half a dozen repeaters. Um, but when we're not running the event and we're just there for work weekends, we have one repeater running off solar um, and it just runs that site. So we go up there, turn a little knob, get 12 hours of radio time, and the battery stays fully charged. So it really depends on what you want to do with it. And when you think about what you want to do with it, you have to figure out how much power that actually involves. And this, this is really where you need to start, is figure out what is your use case, what are you trying to power, and then do some math around uh, how much that means. So when we talk about how much power that is, we talk typically in watt hours per day, right? Um, so this is in a given day, um, how many watts of power do you expect the system to use? Right, so if we use some rough examples, a 50 watt repeater, so like a Yesu DR2X um, that's running 100% duty cycle, so it's continuously transmitting um, and receiving because you're keying it up nonstop all day long, um, you'd be running about 150 watts DC, which for a 24 hour day comes out to around 5,700 watt hours per day. Right, it's a pretty large number. Now that same repeater only running at 10% duty cycle is only about 792 watt hours per day. Right, so you can see the big difference there in duty cycle planning. And again, if we think about planning for worst case um, in the emergency that you have, if, if this is an emergency repeater, again, right, and if it dep depends on your application, you probably need to plan for a pretty high duty cycle, right, um, because that's typically when your net's actually running and you have a lot of people. So maybe not 100%, but um, probably not a, a, you know, a 10, 10, 80 or something like that, which you often see 10, 10% transmit, 10% receive, and 80% and standby. So uh, do your math accordingly. A uh, 10 watt digipeter, for example, even at 100% duty cycle, if it's keyed up nonstop, is only 240 watt hours a day, right? So you can see how those numbers really shift depending on what you're doing and how much power it is. Um, the nice thing is there are good calculators that you can use for this. 
So this is one that I found online. Uh, you can do the math yourself as well, but um, the, this would be for that radio site for the case study, right? So the uplink radio, the access point, the webcam, um, phone adapter, and the ethernet switch as well. Each of them has some DC watts that's based on their power supply or based on the data sheet for each of those. And they all need to be on 24 seven. So when you add those all together, we get this 894 watt hours per day number. So kind of store that in our heads and think about it. Okay, case study, 894 watt hours per day. Okay, any questions on loads before we jump into batteries? Okay, so batteries. Uh, batteries are great. I have a whole separate talk on batteries if you want to talk about batteries. Um, so typically, historically, people used uh, deep cycle lead acids just because they're cheap and regularly available. Um, these days, and especially in the last 12 to 24 months, uh, lithium iron phosphate or LFP batteries are really starting to become more cost effective, especially in the long run. So I am not really able to recommend that anyone buys lead acid batteries for almost any application at this point. So that's my one disclaimer, um, that really lithium iron phosphate is the way to go these days, um, unless you're extremely cash strapped in the course short term and it makes more sense. Um, typically those batteries are 12 volt battery systems for amateur radio. If you're not doing an amateur radio system where your loads are 24 volt or, or 12 volts, you might run a different voltage. So for example, if you're running an Arden node, um, Ubiquity sells a nice little solar controller that runs on a 24 volt battery system because all your PoE devices, power over ethernet, are also running 24 volts. So you can run that natively, you have less conversion losses, um, you have lower cable losses, DC losses through the cables. Um, so that can be a really good system. But typically if we're running like a repeater or a radio system, we're gonna be running on a 12 volt system. And that usually makes the most sense. Um, battery capacities really vary, but typically for an off-grid system, you're something in the like 30 to a couple hundred amp hours of capacity per battery. Um, and it really depends on how big that site is, how much you're powering and how much um, you need to account for. Uh, lead acid is still cheaper per amp hour, um, but uh, lithium iron phosphate packs are getting very, very effective now um, and they're coming down in cost every month. So really, uh, I would do it <laughs> pretty much. Um, you can also build your own. So like this Battleborn here, the great battery, super robust. Um, our local Aries group bought a bunch of these and put them in their van or in their, um, their comm trailer uh, because that is a really robust system. They're very well built, commercially built and they're UL rated. Um, but if you're building one for your own little ham shack, uh, you can DIY your own packs as well and make them even cheaper. So uh, I've done quite a few of those and it's good fun, good experience as a ham too and a uh, good way to do batteries. So that's my brief aside on, on lithium iron phosphate plug. Um, so when we do our battery bank sizing, we start with that daily energy usage, that 894 watt hours per day, and then we apply a D rating, right? And this D rating is for a number of things. One of them is the number of days without sun or reduced sun, right? So how many days of backup power do you need? Cloudy days will only give you 20 to 4% of your solar output. So depending on the environment, the area you're in, um, you'll need to account for the number of overcast days that you get on average. Uh, and that you get in series, right? If you regularly get two weeks at a time where your solar output is reduced to 20%, then you need to account for that with your, with your battery bank and or with your solar panel sizing. Um, colder temperatures are a big issue, especially for lead acid, you'll lose a lot of capacity. Um, your actual uh, available amp hours gets reduced. Uh, and some batteries, like if you're getting a lithium iron phosphate battery, um, you actually, if you're going below zero, you have to get batteries with heaters built into them. So you have to account for that. So before they can start charging, you can still discharge often below zero, but before they can start charging, the batteries will often have to heat themselves up first and then they can start charging, right? So it's just things you have to consider. Um, depth of discharge is the other one or DOD. Um, this is how deeply you cycle your batteries, right? So if a battery has goes from zero to 100%, if you're charging from 100% and you discharge all the way to zero and back up to 100%, that's 100% depth of discharge, right? You go from 100% only down to 50% and back up, that's considered a 50% depth of discharge. For lead acid batteries, you typically do your calculations with a 50% depth of discharge because um, that chemistry really doesn't like getting a full cycle down to zero and back. Um, lithium iron phosphate, on the other hand, doesn't care as much. So you can actually use 100% depth of discharge for your calculations, which hey, you just got twice your money's worth for those batteries, right? So again, <laughs> the, 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 it rules in the favor of lithium iron phosphate where you effectively get twice the capacity, um, equivalent capacity for this system because you can actually use the entire capacity. 
So if we plug this in and do some battery sizing, again, theoretical, 894 watt hours per day, um, we'll use three backup days. We'll say three, three cloudy days or three days where we don't get good sun. We're gonna temperature derate for my area of 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Typically we don't go much below frost level, especially inside a vault or like inside a box with other electronics running. You typically won't get um, that cold. So there's a D rating, you can look up some tables. So 1.4 um, and then a 50% depth of discharge if we're using lead acid, which this system was, so that's what I'm using for the numbers. Um, when we do that math, we come up with a 7,500 uh, 7, uh, watt hours. And then you divide by the battery system voltage. Right. And I prepped you earlier, the one we're using is actually 24 volts because we were running everything PoE, um, not running a repeater at this site. So we divide by 24 volts, which gets us around 300 amp hours of lead acid. Right. Um, so that's quite a bit of battery. Uh, when we plug that into some of the calculators, we get pretty similar numbers as well, 360 amp hours with one of the other online calculators, a little bit less. So the numbers are kind of in that ballpark, but it gives you an idea of what sort of capacity you want to be targeting. Um, so this little ArcNet site that we put together, um, if we need 313 to 360 amp hours of capacity, that's uh, four 200 amp hour 12 volt batteries, right? Because you need stacked on top of each other or 800 amp hour batteries. Holy crap, that's a lot of batteries, right? So um, that seemed like a lot. So I kind of questioned these numbers a little bit and I looked at it. Um, and then we really dug into uh, getting the actual calculation, getting the actual power numbers, right? So data sheet numbers are one thing, um, pulling the the amp like the amperage and the wattage rating of your power supplies for these devices is one thing, but looking at the actual usage of the devices, their actual current, their actual standby usage, and their transmit power is much much more helpful, right? So the calculation said we'd have 37 watts running continuously at this site. When we actually plugged it in, we're only getting 18 watts, and that's actively transmitting, actively streaming one of the cameras, and actively having multiple Wi-Fi devices attached, right? So uh, when we plug those new numbers in, uh, now our site only needs 113 amp hours. And if we reduce it to just two days without sun, um, we can reduce all these numbers significantly, right? So you can see how big of an impact, that's a 3x impact in the number of batteries. It's a 3x impact in the price that you have to pay for your batteries. Um, so we said, okay. And we also said, hey, this is you know early pilot project. We can easily expand it if we need to. So let's just try it out. So we said, okay, I'm just gonna buy 200 amp hour batteries. So we'll start smaller. Um, to get a 24 volt system at 100 amp hours um, and run with that, right? Um, and that worked great. So this site's actually been running very effectively because we don't get a lot of clouds in the Bay Area. Um, we don't get a lot of low temperatures um, and the batteries are generally not getting cycled very much. Um, we also oversized our solar panel, which I'll go into in the next section. So any questions on batteries before we jump to solar panels? And if you get me on a tangent on batteries, I'll go on for like three hours. So we can always save that for afterwards. <laughs> okay, so with solar panels, um, there's a mental model here as well that we need to touch on. So for grid tides, so this is for like your residential solar, you typically maximize for annual production. So that means you're wanting to generate as much electricity throughout the year holistically as possible because you're getting money for putting that power back into the grid and you want to maximize how much you need, especially in areas with like air conditioning and stuff where your biggest AC loads are during the summer, you want to have a really uh, low angle. So the, the panel's pretty, pretty flat so that during the summer, it's getting a lot of um, uh, sunlight, right? For off grid though, again, we have to plan for the worst case. So we're always looking for the maximum power on the shortest day of the year, right? So if you're using this shortest day of the year, in the Northern hemisphere, you're gonna be pointing to the South because that's where your sun is sitting and you wanna match the angle of the sun in the winter. So for example, 30 degree angle um, would be pretty good because you want it to be perpendicular. You want the sun's rays to come normal to the solar panel in the middle of the winter. So that gets you the most production at the end, at the shortest day of the year because that's when you're gonna be on the lowest end of your power budget. In the middle of the summer, it doesn't matter that the panel's pointed down because you have so much light for so long throughout the day it's always gonna charge up your system full. So you're generally gonna be sitting full, like the sun will rise and within two hours, your, your system will be full. Right? But in the winter, it takes almost to the end of the day for that the battery packs to get re recharged. So when we think about how much solar panel we need then, um, we have to kind of look at our previous watt hours per day, right? Um, so we had that 450 number, that was our adjusted number based on actual measurements. Um, and then we have to look at this thing called peak sunlight hours. So peak sunlight hours is a term where uh, the sun is greater than a thousand watts per square meter. Um, 
And that tells you in a different region, how many hours of the average day um, provides you with uh, that amount of solar energy, right? So uh, for a, like seven hours of daylight might only have three to four hours of peak sun, um, of peak sun hours in that, right? So we use what's called an insulation map. Um, again, a lot of sources online, you can just, I've got references at the end of the presentation where you can just look this up. Um, but like in the Bay Area, it's something like three, 3.4 hours for the shortest day of the year, right? So again, the shortest day on the winter solstice, you wanna look at that. Um, versus up in Seattle, it's down to 1.4 hours. Right? So you can see there's almost a 3x scaling factor there, which you need to account for in the sizing of your, of your panels. Um, so the further north you go, of course, Fairbanks, Alaska is down to 0.3 hours. Um, these numbers will vary quite a bit by source, um, but for amateur purposes, you can kind of look at a couple of them, average them out, and, and use your own judgment too for how much you want to spend on that. Um, so when we then do the math here, so again, for the Bay Area um, in, in San Francisco area, we're using that 450 watt hours per day, the 3.4 hours of peak sunlight hours on the shortest day of the year gets us to about 132 watts per day, right? Um, which when we look at the actual watts that we need, then we're looking at, you know, 100 watt panel would be too little. So we'd run out of power on that shortest day. We wouldn't recharge the batteries fully. Um, at, 200 watt panels would do the trick and give you more head headroom, right? So uh, you could do that, or you could get one 200 watt panel, um, or in our case, you could just buy a 250 watt panel because it was on sale on Amazon and it was free shipping, which is kind of crazy for a huge panel like that, but showed up two days later um, and it was a good deal. So uh, yeah, that's great. Um, panels will be rated by their power. Um, they'll also be rated by their open circuit voltage and their short circuit current. So we'll talk about these in the next section. Um, but those are key numbers to think about for solar panels. Um, general guidance solar panels have gotten pretty cheap, especially if you find uh, a local surplus retailer. Um, they'll often sell like excess overstock from a project. So like a large commercial installation will always buy an extra pallet or two in case any get damaged during the install. And when they're done with them, they often get sold to a third party. So like in the Bay Area here in Campbell, there is a, a solar retailer, ML Solar, that just sells panels and they have some really good deals occasionally um, if you only need a couple panels for, for a weird project. So that's uh, a great little resource. Any questions on solar panels? Yes. Yeah, anyway, um, I, I picked up a couple small solar panels at a yard sale. They're, I'm not exactly sure what the wattage is on them. Uh, the stickers are missing, but they're probably about two feet square. So I'm thinking they're probably only maybe 18 or 20 watts. Is that about right? Yeah, that, that, that probably something in that. It depends on uh, what kind of panel they are. So thin film versus monocrystalline or polycrystalline will have different kind of efficiency. Um, a good way to test it is pick the brightest sunshiny day that you can, um, point this panel out at the sun perpendicular to the sun, and then take an open circuit measurement, and then do a short circuit measurement through your multimeter. Well, make sure the multimeter can handle that or some sort of shunt that can handle that current. Um, and then that can give you a good idea of what that power is, right? Um, those are, if you actually look online, the, the, the panel's curve has like a, a, a power curve um, with the open circuit voltage at one end and the short circuit current at the other. And then the maximum power point, which is the wattage rating of the panel is where those two intersect. And there's kind of a, a curve that goes towards that. So you can probably calculate it from there. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I would start there too, because you need to know that open circuit voltage since you won't be in real full sun, um, I would add a little buffer to that measurement. So for example, if you measure 22 volts, I would get a controller that does at least 30 volts um, so that you don't blow up your solar controller in suddenly a much brighter day when you bring it down to Arizona or something, so. Okay. What about, what about using residential panels? Yeah, residential panels um, will often be higher voltage as well. Um, so uh, when you look in like the RV space, like that's where a lot of these panels are sold. They're typically sold as like 12 volt panels or 24 volt panels. Um, so their, their nominal voltage is at a, at a point where they're just above that charging threshold so that you can have a step down converter, a buck converter effectively in your controller that provides that voltage. Um, now with, depending on the size of your site. So for residential, for example, you're talking kilowatt systems, right? So there's a lot of current that gets involved. So you generally want to go to higher voltages. So you often see series strings of panels to get up to several hundred volts, right? 
Um, and uh, several hundred volts means that you can drop your current significantly and don't have as much uh, resistive loss. Um, now with higher voltage panels, you also need to make sure your controllers match. So actually at Cal Poly, we have a handful of panels that the club has that are I think 76 volt or something open circuit or 80 volt open circuit. Um, that's pretty high. So you actually have to specifically look and find controllers that can match that. Um, but other than that, I mean, which panel you use? Yeah, there's some efficiency losses. So depending on the controller you have and how efficient it is, if you're running like a controller and you're running it on a 12 volt battery, you'll often see the controllers have ratings for a 12 volt system, a 24 volt system and a 48 volt system. And as you go to a higher voltage system, the controller can handle much more input power. Um, and actually, sorry, I could, I think I have a slide kind of on this. Yeah, this one here, right? So um, you can see that the actual solar input power for this one controller at 12 volts is only 260 watts, but at 24 volts, it's twice that because it's current limited, right? So it's based on how much current the inductors and the components inside the controller can handle. So with a higher voltage panel, you can actually, or sorry, the higher voltage solar uh, battery system, you can actually run more panels and get more power into it. And can you mix and match panels? Uh, yes, uh, with a couple asterisks on it. Uh, <laughs> depending on uh, the voltage of those panels. So generally speaking, um, yeah, if they're in parallel, you need their voltage, their, uh, let's get this right. So if they're in parallel, you want their voltages to match. And if you, they're in series, their currents need to match. I would generally not mismatch panels onto one controller. Um, what you'll actually see uh, companies like Genesun, they make some really nice solar controllers for like Marine and actually a couple amateur radio specific ones um, that are really low HF noise. Uh, those, will be designed to be one controller per panel actually. So on a boat, for example, where you have panels all around the boat, if you have them all into one controller, there's always gonna be at least one panel that's shaded by like your mast on the sailboat. Um, so they'll have a separate controller for each one so they can get the maximum efficiency out of each panel, right? So that's generally what I advise if you're mix and matching panels is to have separate controllers for them. Uh, they can all feed the same battery because as long as you're not exceeding the charge charge rate of the battery, um, then there's not a concern there. Marcel, you, you mentioned a, a company in the Bay Area that, because um, I have a specific uh, 24 volt system that we're looking to do uh, some battery backup and solar panels with. Uh, could you give me the name of that company? That yeah, has at, at ML Solar, Mike Lima Solar. I think dot com or something. That's the one I remember. I've been there once, I think. Um, but okay. they have a pretty good selection online. Um, the other one is honestly looking at uh, also industrial surplus sites as well are a good option often. Um, uh, or lo local solar installers too, especially if there's a smaller business that does solar panel installs. Um, especially if they're moving stock or they're now switched to new panel for the next model year and the manufacturer is no longer supporting the old one, but they only have like five panels left and they need at least... 10 for a residential install or something, um, they'd probably be thrilled to sell it to you at a good discount. So reach out, make some contacts. Um, uh, the One of the first sets of large panels that I got was a pallet of panels that my buddy and I split off some guy on Craigslist, got a great deal on them. Um, the one downside that I'd recommend is make sure that when you do get panels, especially getting them used, um, make sure they have frames on them. So like the steel or aluminum frames around the panel um, so that they aren't just bare sandwich glass, those are very fragile. Um, and ideally not some sort of exotic chemistry. Um, I got a pair of cadmium telluride panels once that were less than ideal um, and they broke very easily because they didn't have frames on them. So I would not recommend those. <laughs> um, and then as, as the other gentleman mentioned too, is that sometimes you need to check for uh, what they're rated. So if they don't have a sticker on them, it's probably okay. You just might be in a corner. You might have to get a slightly more expensive controller then to be able to handle those panels. Um, if you don't know what they're rated and you have to do some research on them. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions on solar panels? Cool. All right, solar controllers. So generally there are two types of solar controllers in, this, in the market. There's a PWM or pulse width modulated and MPPT or maximum PowerPoint tracking. So uh, PWM controllers, uh, they're small, they're cheap. They're literally just an on off switch. So think of them as a little light switch that's just flipping on and off. It's briefly connecting the input voltage to the output voltage. Um, so if your solar panel input is 40 volts input, when you hook it up to the battery, you're literally closing that and you're briefly hooking up 40 volts to the 12 volt battery. 
right? And the battery will bring it down to that voltage, it'll current limit, and then it'll, it'll fill it in. So it's doing that pulsing, right? Uh, you can see why that's not necessarily a great idea. It's not the most efficient thing to do. Um, and you generally want that tighter matching. So when someone sells like doing a 40 volt panel onto a 12 volt battery would not be a good idea. That's where those solar panels that are sold as 12 volt panels, right? Their open circuit voltage might only be 16 or 18 volts. That's then more acceptable, right? Um, so keep that in mind. They are cheap, but honestly, for ham purposes, I wouldn't touch them. Um, I've, I've played with one or two a couple of times. You can get them like really cheap, like five, $10 from um, various online sources, um, but they're super noisy as well. And oftentimes, especially the really cheap ones, they're actually low side switching, which is something you need to be very careful with where they effectively are a, a, a positive ground, right? So your, your negative side is the actual one that's switching. So you have to be very careful with ground loops and make sure that your equipment's hooked up properly and that you don't like ground past it because then you'll actually bypass the controller sometimes. So uh, I would avoid these. Um, maximum power point tracking is where it is. So MPBT. So this is an actual full-blown buck converter, um, sometimes a buck boost converter that can actually boost up the voltage as well. Um, so that's got uh, a switching circuit inside it, uh, which actually does the voltage conversion. So this will provide a regulated output voltage and current um, to properly charge batteries and, and be very nice. So um, they can do much better efficiency because what they actually do is they do a load pull on the panel and depending on the units, you know, sometimes a couple times a second, sometimes once a minute, depending on the algorithm, it will, we talked about that power curve earlier, it'll briefly sweep that power curve and find the point that has the highest amount of power. And then it'll do its conversion and feed it out to the battery at the best um, possible efficiency. So MPBT is, is definitely the way to go. This is everything in industry. Um, uh, they can be a little bit more expensive though. Again, in the last couple of years, they've really dropped in price, especially for like 100, 200 watt system units. Um, these are typically sold by amperage. Um, that amperage is usually either the load, the load current limit or the battery um, charge limit, or sometimes the same. So like a 30 amp unit um, will probably be able to support 30 amp loads and up to 30, uh, watt, uh, 30 amps of uh, battery charging current as well. Um, so when you pick a controller, a couple of things we have to think about. One is the total, total solar panel wattage, right? So it needs to be able to handle more than your panel's wattage that you're inputting. Um, otherwise you're throwing away panel, uh, effectively you're throwing away some of the wattage from your panel. It uh, needs to be able to support the battery voltage so and battery chemistry, right? So if you're running a lithium iron phosphate system, make sure that the controller can handle a charge profile for lithium iron phosphate. Uh, it needs to be able to handle your peak current loads for DC, assuming that you're passing through. So there are kind of two types of controllers. I don't dive into this, but one is where your load is actually, your battery is hooked up to one terminal and your load comes out of the controller. So like this one, um, so solar panel in and then the load comes out. Um, there are also controllers like the ones from Genesun, which are just chargers. So your load, you actually hook up directly to the battery and the, the solar controller just charges the battery. So it has solar panel in, battery out. There's no load out on the controller. So there's two different types. Um, and then the last point is the maximum input voltage. So this is your solar panel open circuit voltage. You need to make sure that it can accept that, right? So that's, that's really key. So if we look at two of the options here, so again, using that 250 watt, watt panel as a, as a case study, we're using a 24 volt battery system. We have two amps of load. Uh, we have this 37 volt open circuit and just shy of nine volts uh, short circuit. So ISC, I, I, current short circuit. Um, for both of these models, so CMD20 and CMD40, there's 12 and 24 volt battery recognition, great. Um, the load current uh, is 20 amps for both of them, no problem. Um, the input short circuit current from the photovoltaic is 250 amps, no problem, or sorry, 25 amps, no problem. The battery voltage range, this one's selectable from eight to 32, great. The input solar voltage, 150 volts. So this one actually accepts a very high voltage. So for this panel with only 37 volts open circuit, no problem. Um, and the maximum solar input power for this 24 volts configuration is 520 watts. So we could actually run two of these panels um, in parallel on this controller without any issues. Um, and that was a consideration as well, is saying, hey, if we do want to expand this site in the future, the controller already supports it. We literally hook up another panel and add two Y cables and you're done. And if you want to add more batteries, you just add two more batteries in parallel and you're done, right? So it's a pretty easy, like scaling up and down is pretty straightforward if you plan for it, right? So spending a couple extra bucks now to get a slightly larger controller to give you expansion room in the future, um, definitely worth it.
Um, okay. Uh, one, one other thing to mention. So a lot of the newer controllers these days have a lot more features. So you have, um, so this, this particular model that I've used um, uh, is a little bit, as it's now five, five, 10 years old, almost in the style. Um, you can get a lot these days with uh, Bluetooth control on them as well, where you can either do remote monitoring um, or actual remote control where you can turn on and off loads from your cell phone, for example. Um, if that's something that you like, or you want like a remote panel control panel, if this is going in a shed or in a, in a vault and you need remote monitoring capabilities, and you want to be able to talk to it. Um, this one you can actually hook up. It's got a, um, a RS, uh, this one says RSJ45. Um, that's not quite, yeah, it's the, you can get some with communication protocols, ports on them. So either serial ports or um, CAN bus even, uh, or Bluetooth uh, that you can then link in. A uh, couple that are ethernet controlled. So if you're running like a, a Hamwan site or something, you could actually plug it directly into the network and and pull it. So that can be really useful depending on your application if you want more remote monitoring or remote control capabilities. Any questions on controllers? Uh, Some of the MPPT controllers are really noisy. Ironically, one of them is the one that West, West Mountain Power sells. Um, is there, I know Jenison's are quiet, DIY Solar for You are quiet. Are there others that you use that are that are really quiet that are good values? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. So especially the MPPT controllers are very noisy because they're doing major switching. <laughs> so there's uh, those are not good. MPPT will generally be better, but it really depends on the specific model. Um, and it depends on the bands that you're talking about, right? So this particular site was a microwave site. So we we're dealing with 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. We weren't dealing with anything lower, though we did have to deal with coexistence because typically we're operating a VHF mobile radio at that site when we deploy. So that is a factor. Um, we don't, for the Gerbertino setup at least, we didn't care about HF noise, so that wasn't an issue. Um, the Jenison is the only other one that I have personal experience with that's purpose-built for low noise. Um, they are a little bit more expensive, but I found they're very, very clean, very small unit. Um, they don't handle larger panels and larger currents, so you really are doing that kind of one controller per panel if you're doing a larger install. But for a small portable system or field day system, they're perfect. Um, I used it at field day this year, and we ran the whole weekend on one of those, um, and that was great. So, yeah. Does that answer your question, Del? Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Are there a couple other questions? Yeah, I had I had a question on that. Um, if you have a noisy controller, if it goes into the battery separate from feeding the radio, will the battery act as a filter and take some of the noise out or does that not matter? Depends on the type of noise that you're dealing with, right? So you've got radiated emissions and conducted emissions, right? Um, or in conductive noise. So it really depends on what the, the mode is in this case, right? So you can start fighting these with your usual RFI tools that you have in your Hamshack toolbox, right? Of, hey, let's add some chokes here. Let's add some toroids. Let's do a couple winds through this. Um, let's see if we can add some series filtering. You can use one of the power line conditioning models if it's, uh, you know, modules from like MFJ. Um, those are all things that you can do. Right. Um, so depending if you're running a remote HF site and you know that you're going to need low HF noise, I would start with the highest quality controller and, and, and not, not push your luck. So start with Jenison or start with a known controller that's purpose built and designed to be quiet um, to make sure that you don't run into those issues. Knowing it's going to cost you more, but better than buying two controllers. Right. Okay. Well, that answers that question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really, it's, an, it's mostly an HF problem because that's where the noise really becomes an issue. Um, I haven't seen controllers that put out large harmonics at anything in the microwave space. So depending on the type of site you're deploying or if you're just doing a weather station and it has like a cell modem, probably not going to be an issue, right? Or if it has a point-to-point -point link back to um, your house, for example, to get internet or something, usually not an issue. Other question? Okay. So deployment, I like to pause on this slide. You guys have had a couple minutes to look at. Is there anything that you observe that is odd about these solar panels? Looks like they're covered in dust. <laughs> it looks like they're covered in dust. So you see yeah, there's a reflection of this, the clouds in them, um, but the actual colors of the panels are all very different, right? So these are um, uh, Harbor Freight special uh, thin film solar panels. So these are actually a very different manufacturing process. I mean, you can see the variation just between the panels, right? This second one is very red, right? And then the next one's gray and then it's kind of blue. So they have very different color profiles. 
um, and resultingly probably quite different performance characteristics as well. So you do get what you pay for to some extent. You can get some great deals. And if you don't need maximum efficiency and you're okay with it being significantly derated from what they claim on their website, can be a good option. So yes, we did actually run a radio site on two of the, I think it was 150 watt uh, Harbor Freight specials and it worked, right? Um, but your mileage may vary. So just something to be aware of. And I think that's always an interesting collection to see. Okay, so when we do deployment, uh, documentation is king. So I always remind everyone, document, document, document. You're going to thank yourself for it later. Anyone else that ever visits the site or needs to work on it is going to thank you. Um, when I took over as repeater trustee for W6 TDM, I was thrilled because the previous trustee had this beautiful binder with hand-drawn schematics of everything, all the manuals for all the equipment. It was just absolute glorious, um, absolutely glorious. So I highly recommend you do good documentation. So for all our sites, that absolutely stands. And it can be pretty simple, right? This is just in Google diagrams. Again, we look at that model, right? Solar panel, solar controller, battery bank on the left, and then all our DC loads here on the right, right? So we had 12 volt PO, or sorry, 24 volt PoE injectors. We had an active PoE injector for the webcam. We actually had to do a DC to DC converter to get some 12 volt because we did have the switch and the um, analog telephone adapter running on 12 volts. Um, to Dell's earlier question too, you have to be careful with these DC to DC converters because those can be very noisy as well because that's another switching regulator that's in this system. Um, so you have to be a little bit cautious. Just make sure that whatever you're using for that, um, if it's a site that's critical, you might need to spend a couple prettier pennies to get some nicer converters that aren't noisy on HF. Um, when you actually deploy, label everything, right? Um, Yes, I own a label maker and I use it a lot. I use it regularly. I used it this weekend to label a whole bunch. Um, and it's super helpful, right? Both for yourself and again, for anyone looking at this in the future. Um, this system, since we had multiple bus voltages that we're dealing with, so we have 12, 24 and 48 volt buses that are running on this system, which is pr pretty annoying. Um, Everything is labeled. Um, you'll also notice that there is a very common amateur radio connector that is completely missing from this shelf. Right? There is no Anderson power pole to be found here at all. Um, that's by design. Uh, the last thing I wanted is some ham whose battery system failed during a deployment to open up the cabinet of a 24 volt system, see a power pole connector and plug it into the radio and fry their radio. Right. So when you're using standards, make sure they're standard. Um, and if you're using something that's not a standard, um, don't use the wrong standard. Right? There's a great XKCD on that. So this system very specifically does not have Anderson power pull on it and we kept it that way. Um, but everything is labeled, right? So input power comes in and then you're just feeding all your various systems, goes through your DC to DC regulators and, and feeds the whole system. Um, put together, it looked like this, pretty simple. Little plastic $40 box from Lowe's. You've got the top shelf with all your networking equipment and DC distribution. Um, the middle shelf with the actual solar controller. These have a cute little um, screen on it. Um, and then the two batteries at the bottom with the very high-tech anti-earthquake uh, bricks in the bottom to just prevent the batteries from sliding back and forth in there if there was movement. Um, but that just sits there. Um, Ethernet cables go to the roof. And then this is on the roof. We have our big 250 watt solar panel and you notice the very steep angle on this, right? So um, we are maximizing for that shortest day where the sun is the lowest in the sky. Um, and then the pole here in the back with the actual equipment on it. Um, that solar panel in all its beautiful glory doesn't need much from mounting perspective. This was a nice roof. We could just put some bolts into it and seal it um, and just build my own little frame out of aluminum channel um, or a square stock. And uh, that worked great. Uh, you can also get fancier setups. One of the other sites, we built a big Unistrut mount for it. Uh, if you're doing a rooftop mounting, there's purpose-built mounting for panels. So you can get pretty creative there. Um, the one caution here is if you're deploying somewhere that does have plant growth or animal life, um, keep those in keep those into consideration. So if the grass is going to grow very tall, make sure that the panel is mounted above the height of that grass. Um, uh, keep an eye out for trees that are going to grow in the future and where they're going to grow and if they're going to shade your panel. Um, and if there are a lot of birds in the area, um, bird poop does cover up panels. So um, keep that in mind and maybe add some mitigations for that. Which leads us into our maintenance section. So uh, first maintenance item is batteries, right? So for lead acid batteries, typically they only have a five-year lifetime. Um, that's just manufacturer's data sheet. Chemistry kind of gets sad uh, for sealed lead acid chemistries. Um, 
that's very dependent on how much you cycle them, right? So the depth of the discharge and how much high and low temperature they saw. Um, this is probably the most costly part of your maintenance because you're replacing that hardware when it goes bad. Um, this picture here in the bottom right, this is a battery backup system in a, in a parking garage somewhere that I happened to drive past when I saw a truck pull up with a flatbed full of batteries and they were swapping them all out. And I was like, oh, this is great. Let me go talk to them. And I got this great picture where this fourth battery from the left, you'll notice is missing its lid. The lid is actually down here on the bottom shelf. So they had one of these batteries where one of the lids popped off it. And sure enough, they get to replace the entire string. So uh, that was fun. Um, but uh, the, that's, that's pretty common. So the, these just die. And then part of maintenance is replacing batteries. Um, with lithium iron, lithium iron phosphate, they're rated for like 10 times the number of cycles. Um, so you can get many, many more years out of it, right? So for, for a lead acid battery, if you're doing 100% depth of discharge, they might only last a few hundred cycles, which is only a year or two maybe, right? If you're doing a full cycle a day, right? If you're doing a half cycle a day, then double that. Um, for uh, lithium iron phosphate, they're often rated for a few thousand cycles of 100% depth of discharge. Right, so you can see again, if you're doing a long-term deployment somewhere, uh, that, that already pays for itself just in replacement, right? So that's uh, another plug for lithium iron phosphate. Um, and then the other maintenance thing, so this is legit real maintenance from this site. We haven't actually replaced the batteries yet. They are at their five-year lifetime, right? I mentioned that, I mean, they are lead acid at this site. We are planning on replacing them with 24 volt um, lithium iron phosphate. And yes, we bought a controller that allows us to put a custom charge profile in it to support it. So again, thinking forward, our initial deployment, we saved a little bit of money. We wanted to try it out. And five years later, we could then put the larger investment in to put the better batteries in um, and make it last longer um, from there. Um, the next maintenance point is panel cleaning. So this one I think is great. I've got a couple of great pictures. Um, this is that same site. Uh, with, within two months, that's what the panel looked like. Um, they were doing some construction next, next door and moving a bunch of dirt around. So there was just this thin coat of dust everywhere. Um, that panel was no longer putting out 250 watts at peak sun hours, I'll tell you that much. Um, I would treat that as similar to a cloudy day, right? Except that instead of only budgeting for three cloudy days, you now are budgeting for infinite number of cloudy days until you remember to go clean the panel, right? So you have to account for that. Um, one more reason to get more panels than you actually need for your budget. Um, similarly, a couple more extreme cases. Um, this top one's a photo of uh, Black Rock City, Nevada uh, at Burning Man. Um, and that lady has to come out with a broom and a leaf blower. That was in the earlier picture to blow the dust off the panels multiple times per week because they get these dust storms there. So um, bottom right, of course, snow covering panels. That might be an issue in your area. Um, depending on the panels, the angle of the panels, the type and color of the panels, um, that can be a problem as well. Uh, and the bottom left is a panel that I believe had some uh, cement dust on it from a construction site as well. Uh, and that has to get scraped off. So uh, all things to consider when you think about your deployments, um, maybe rain -X or put some other coating on the surface of the panels to make them easier to clean off, depending on what it is. If you have a lot of birds in the area, I've definitely seen some panels like on light poles with some crazy amounts of bird poop on them. Uh, so they need to plan for that as well. So with that, that covers the majority of my talk. This is a picture of the other, this is the main sector site for ArcNet. Um, that's 400 watt panels on that Unistrut frame. Um, and we got the box with the batteries behind it. So uh, hopefully that was interesting to all of you. I'm happy to take any questions and go anything you might have. Uh, and yeah, my plugs at the bottom, uh, my volunteer tower climber plug is less, less common for Pacific Northwest unless you want to pay for my flights up there um, or take a long train ride. But otherwise, uh, happy to give talks and uh, got a nice list on my uh, QRZ page um, and a whole bunch of references and further reading uh, in the slide deck as well that I linked in the chat. So a lot of good resources from other pages. So Marcel, question for you? Yeah. On the cleaning of the solar panels, uh, can you use soap and water and hose them off? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny because the residential solar community has some pretty strong opinions on this. Um, most, uh, most solar contracts for residential solar will say don't actually touch your panels uh, or only maybe leaf blow them or, or dry brush them off. Don't put any chemicals on it. Um, so there, there's definitely mixed data in industry for what is recommended for consumers to do. Um, me personally, for my sites, if there's dirt on the panel, I will wipe it off, right? Um, now, if I will put some, if I will use soap, for example, really depends. If it's filled with bird poop, yes, I will use soap to get that off there because it's better to get that off there, even if it leaves a little bit of residue and maybe 
leads to more dust collecting on there in the future, that's still worth it to get that bird poop off, right? Same for cement dust, for example, right? Um, that would be a problem. Or if you're in an area with, yeah, corrosives or something, you de definitely want to do that. So, well, yeah, I mean, clean it. I wouldn't, there's, there's definitely some data around what you can use for cleaning. Honestly, if it's just dust like that, um, the, the panel at ArcNet, this one, I just use a dry cloth and just wipe it off, just wipe it off and that's fine. Um, and that's, that's generally accepted. Main thing is you don't want to scratch them, obviously, because that reduces their efficiency, could, could lead to cracking as well. Um, and you don't want to put any hard chemicals. Uh, the surface of the panels is usually glass if they're uh, one of the silicone substrates, um, but some flexible panels might have some plastic surfaces on them. Right, or rubberized surfaces. So those are more susceptible to chemicals. So you want to be very careful with what you're using on, on non-glass encapsulated panels. So just water, uh, obviously it has to be able to withstand rain. Yep. So just basically using a hose or a little- Use a hose, wipe it down, yeah. brush it off, use a cloth, something like that. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. And, and no car wax with ultraviolet protection in it, I presume. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny because we talk about that, uh, that for for one of the sites I was consulting for this uh, with the cement dust, we were actually talking about, well, that dust builds up every six to 12 months um, uh, near a cement plant. It's like, okay, well, how do you deal with that? And it's like, okay, well, maybe you scrape it off and then put a layer of wax on it to make it easier to clean off next time or or like a, a Rain-X or some other treatment to help um, have the material just come off more easily in the rain. Um, but yes, to your point, Till, if it has like UV stabilizers in it, then it's going to reduce the efficiency of your panel. But again, it's a trade-off, right? In our case, if you know having piles of snow or sand or, or bird poop on the panel is going to be worse than the couple percent efficiency loss you might have from whatever treatment you put on there, it might be acceptable, right? You could even put a film on the top of it, like the Formula One racers that have the film over their visors every time the, the bugs hit it, they can just peel it off. Um, that's an option as well, right? So you could, could do a film on there. Um, I don't think I've actually seen that, but I could see that having some practical applications. Other questions? Well, I was going to do it in the chat, but uh, I might as well do it here. Um, would you mind if we um, put your presentation both on uh, our Google um, website and also on our YouTube channel? Yeah, that's fine. I've, I've got the presentation is already on my YouTube as well, but it's an older version of it. So this one's slightly newer with more plugs for lithium iron phosphate because um, that's really the chemistry you should be using these days. And it, the, the technology evolves and it's evolving very quickly in the last five years. So uh, it's been pretty fun to watch that. Um, yeah. And the other question I have was, um, do you have any, um, any sites where you're using um, mixed either AC power as well as, uh, I'm asking this because specifically the one site that I'm working on is a 24 volt system that has AC and we are doing battery backup for it, but um, considering solar in addition to keep the batteries charged while um, you know, the AC is missing. Yeah, um, the, uh, me personally, I haven't deployed any. Um, I've helped work on some and maintain some, uh, but there's quite a bit. Um, actually, uh, Will Prowse, he's a, he's a YouTuber. I actually respect his work quite a bit. He's got a very good YouTube channel and um, uh, a website where originally for RVers, but he has a lot of good tips there for both DC only and AC and DC um, uh, systems. Uh, he has a, a, a few good recommendations there on inverters that are good for off-grid and grid tie setups. Um, of course, if it's grid tied, you, there's a lot more um, inspection and permitting that is involved, right? If you're doing a fully off-grid, you can really do almost whatever you want, um, especially on private property. So that makes a big difference. Um, but yeah, they, they have some good resources there. Uh, depends on how complex the system gets and how big it gets as well. But there are people that have done completely off-grid split, split phase 120, 240 volt systems. Um, with several days of backup and several kilowatts of solar. So there's a lot out there. And there's a pretty big DIY community in, in that space right now. All right, thank you. Yeah, sure thing, Jeff. Anyone else? Well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to 
thank Marcel on behalf of the club.